Welcome, Brooke. How are you going? Yeah, pretty good, mate. Um, it's, a, it's a great weather outside. I'm, I'm glad to be spending the time with you. What about yourself? <laughs> Inside with the, the lamp on. <laughs> I'm really well, thank you. I'm really well. Uh, I know we chatted a little bit before, so we already covered a lot of the, um, a lot of what each of us have been doing recently, but going really well. Thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So before we get started, I'm just going to give a bit of a summary of Brooke's kind of achievements and experiences so far, and any that I kind of miss, I'm happy for you to jump in because I might have missed some of those. Uh, and then we're going to deconstruct his journey from going from student uh, to, or even pre-student to graduate and now having an awesome job. And we're going to look into that and have a bit of fun. So that hopefully students and graduates watching this can get a bit of, uh, yeah, a bit of insights and tips and tricks on, on how they might be able to get the same kind of results. So, so Brooke completed a, it was a Bachelor of Economics from UWA plus honours with first class honours, congratulations, and has had quite a few different experiences. So economic research intern, consultant at CCG, four years as one of uh, Baby Bunting's top sales assistants, uh, maybe the top, I'm not sure, a, a tutor at UWA, a finance and economics editor for the Pelican magazine, and I'm sure I've, I've missed some things here, but now he's working as a corporate finance consultant at Paxson Group, one thing I will add that's naturally not, I don't think, on his LinkedIn, which is what I'm looking at, is he's also an avid entrepreneur. So I think he's run a, run a few different businesses, um, which I'm happy to... I, th I think he flipped cars for a while, making profit off that, uh, investing, etc. So, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it, Brooke. Anything else I've missed? No, no, I think that, that makes it sound um, a lot fancier than it really is. Um, but, but yeah, no, I, I've done a few things, just things that interest me. Um, and I'm very lucky to say, be working in my dream job at the moment. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Well, why don't we get started with, you know, all the way back at the beginning when you maybe were kind of finishing high school, what made you decide to study economics? It's mm, a good question. Um, at the time I'd taken economics units in in high school thought I kind of liked it but the real driver for me is I feel like I've always been an entrepreneurial person um, so I remember back in primary school actually I would go to the local markets buy Pokemon cards in, in the big packs come back to primary school and, and make my own uh, booster decks is what they used to call them and then sell them to all the kids at school um, and the kids would buy them from me because I'd always throw in extra things like um, little plush toys or stuff like that. Um, so <laughs> ever since, you know, around seven or eight, uh, I've been, I've had that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, that followed me, say, after high school, um, as you touched on, I started buying cars. I liked the idea of driving cool cars. Um, so in order to do that, uh, I would buy ones that, you know, maybe weren't the best looking or, or I had a few problems with them. Um, fortunately, I had a few people around me that really helped uh, with that. Like my housemate for a while, he was a mechanic. Um, so I was fixing up cars just because I wanted to drive them. Um, and I also had a trailer hire business, which was something that I got into because I, I went to always buy these cars that weren't working and I needed to hire a trailer. And then I realized <laughs> there, was, there was a niche in the market for me to buy a couple car trailers and start hiring them out. Anyway, so I, I was an entrepreneurial person. I saw economics as, you know, what you would study if you want to get more into business. Um, so I chose to study an economics degree. Uh, as I was going through university, I... Uh, was sort of leaning I, I wasn't sure maybe if if law might be better um i met a lawyer on a night out funnily enough i, I was uh, walking around the city about to go to the club for my mate's 19th as we're walking across um st george's terrace in in the perth cbd there, there's a guy next to us and he's just about to jaywalk and i say to him mate don't do that like you'll get in trouble there's police over there and, and he turns around and says to me, mate, I'm a lawyer. I think I can talk us both out if we do the, if we walk across on the red signal. <laughs> um, anyway, so I got to talking to him. Turns out he was uh, 
the director of his own commercial law firm in the city. Um, so that was my first experience running into, say, a professional and, and having a coffee chat with him. And he was uh, very generous with his time, gave me a lot of feedback and tips. But um, after a while and after talking to him, I realized I didn't want to pursue law. Uh, anyway, so chose economics. That's why, because I linked up with um, choosing something entrepreneurial. And, and that's, that's how I ended up studying my degree. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so you talked before a little bit about your entrepreneurial ventures. So the you said that the, the car flipping and the uh, the Pokemon cards. Why not just go straight into a an entrepreneurial type or an endeavor or a business right from the get go? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and really, I think maybe it was just external influences. Um, but I thought that, you know, I could go into it and I could, say, start up a coffee shop or a pizza shop. That, that's something I really wanted to do. I want to start up a pizza shop. So, something like that. Just have <laughs> a crack at it. Um, but I was thinking about it and I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if... I can get a job where I get to learn about how other people run their businesses um, and I get paid to do that and then I get skilled doing that then I can go do it myself uh, and that's exactly you know the sort of role that I'm in I'm, I'm building the skills every day so that I can perhaps do my own entrepreneurial venture in the future if that's the road I still want to go down on um, and to me I feel like this path learning from people who've done things before uh, is more efficient than jumping myself in the deep end, buying a coffee business or something, and then I probably would have gone bankrupt during COVID and wouldn't have known what hit me. Uh, so I'm glad that I've done it the way I've done it, but uh, other people with different risk tolerances, yeah, they might have jumped straight into it and honestly, more power to them. That's awesome. It's so funny listening to your story. <clears throat> I remember how... how uh similar we are in terms of our background i mean one of the things that i also did when i was in high school was um not as early as you though was to uh you know you know have you heard of fifa the the game that you play yeah, on yeah, yeah. so I was, I was a pretty avid soccer player and then so i obviously got into fifa and i was selling um i was trading those cards on that interface like a, it was like this on, online market for players and that was my first way of really making money selling money I was selling cards on um, on that that site and then on eBay until I got screwed over by some guy who just basically took all my money <laughs> up on PayPal and they wouldn't give it back. But that's so so fascinating. That's awesome. And so 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 you decided to study economics. And so so what did your journey look like from then? So you kind of started your first year. What did you start thinking about at that point? Did you start thinking about careers at that point or? Were you focused on studies? Do you remember? Yeah, I think um, the, probably the first year of my, say, um, uni journey, I would say I was uh, stumbling around in the dark in terms of what a career looked like for me and uh, what I actually wanted to do. Uh, I think I really enjoyed the social aspect of university. Mm. Um, and at the time, I'd probably been listening to the wrong people giving me advice saying all you really needed is just to pass in your <clears> degree and then and then things will work themselves out uh, sort of thing. And honestly, that is great advice if I was graduating, say, in the 70s or 80s, where uh, about the top 10% of the population or only 10% of the population had a tertiary degree. Um, nowadays, it's it's around 50%. So if 50% of the population ha has, a, has at least a uh, bachelor's degree, it's probably not so hot if um, it's not 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 as easy just just to go through cruising. Um, so so uh, I was focusing on other things like as, as you mentioned, I was really enjoying myself. This went even into my second year. I'd moved out of home. Um, I was working as at a pizza shop every now and then as a delivery driver. 
um, and I was working in sales at a baby rear tower of all places um, <laughs> while, while, while also flipping cars and doing that trailer hire business um, and having a social life. So there's no wonder why my academic performance struggled. Um, it wasn't until I started trying to apply for internships because once again, I was just listening to the people around me didn't necessarily have a plan for myself and then at the start of my second year I heard you know Brooke you should be applying for internships so I gave it a crack and I uh, wondered why no one wanted to interview me <laughs> so I think that was a bit of a rude awakening um, right right in the middle of my second year there and after that that's when I started say doing my own research and coming up with a plan for what I wanted to do um, I'd say that that's how my whole first year of uni went and then in my second year that, that's when I started um, realizing where I was becoming say more self-aware um, and, and looking more ahead because at the time I was having a really great time um, but I ne don't think I, I'd done the, the forward planning that I should have mm. and and so when you talk about so 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 first year that makes sense you're kind of easing in and taking on some advice from other people, doing all these other things, the social stuff. And then second year, you started going for these internships. You thought, okay, got to maybe get a bit more serious about this. And what did that look like for you? Was it, when you say apply for internships, was it you applied to like three or four through the applications, submitted some resume that you found online? What, how did you go about it? What were the, like, what were the numbers involved in that? Like, was it 20 applications? Was it 30? Mm. First of all, I still remember my, my resume it had um, little pictures on it, like 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 those those word those word art thing, like the iconographs. It's like education, and it had like a little picture of um, uh, uh, like what looks like a degree, and then it said like work experience and then other stuff. Oh my goodness, yeah, no, no wonder. And like I had color in there that just didn't make sense. Uh, look, if I was a hiring manager, I really would have wondered what <laughs> it was in entertaining um to look back on but yeah at, at the time i just didn't know um and then in terms of my application approach or internship approach mm. um yeah it was spray and pray going on a, a website like um grad jobs or something like that grad connection cool. yeah yeah grad connection that that would be the one um and then just applying for all the ones that looked cool um and then wondering why i didn't hear back not necessarily putting together the best tailored cover letters, etc. And and was that are we talking like quite a few applications? Was it just kind of sporadic, one here, one there? Um, yeah, I would say it, it would be. It wasn't. It wasn't very targeted. I never made a list. Um, I didn't have the Excel sort of uh, system that I had later on when I was applying. Um, I, I would say definitely less than 20, maybe around 10 applications or so. Um, and they were all applying through the front door uh, as well. So that's a key thing that um, I'm sure, you know, you, you taught me this actually. Um, if you just apply through stage one of the filtering process, then you've got the highest likelihood of being filtered out. Um, so the odds weren't necessarily in my favor and I wasn't stacking them in my favor. Hmm. And, and at this point, I'm really interested. So did you have much clarity about what you wanted to try out in terms of internships? No, I didn't either. See, the people around me or at uni or whatnot, um, they all talked about, hey, how uh, big four would be great experience and whatnot. So um, I gave that a go. I gave a few other roles that seemed interesting to me a go. Um, but it wasn't targeted and I don't think I had that foresight, honestly. Hmm. Okay. So that was kind of how second year went. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I'd say up until about the midpoint of second year, um, at, on the, on the back end of the second year, my second half, uh, there were two things that I did that really set me up. Um, I would say it really allowed me a lot of personal growth and, and self-realization to go into my third year. Uh, the first was I'd applied for, uh, through my university, 
um, through the McCusker Charitable Foundation in mm. internship with them. Uh, so they placed me at Anglecare WA. Yep. Um, so I did an internship at Anglecare WA in sort of a research role. Uh, so the research role was looking at how the service recipients or the clients of Anglecare WA can have more feedback into the services that are delivered for them. Um, and this was really, I'd say, eye-opening for me. Um, just because, like, if you if you look at say service delivery, we're, we're talking about uh, counselling, um, which may be dealing with domestic violence and maybe dealing with um, supervised uh, visiting of, of children. Um, there was also something which really interested me in there, which was financial counselling um, and helping those who are running into problems with with debt or helping them navigate the welfare system. Um, and it really put in perspective how lucky I was to be studying at university, um, to have had the home life I had, and it sort of made me realise I was taking my degree for granted, I think. Um, and I was taking my opportunities that were given to me for granted. Um, because of that, I think at that point, I, I decided that I wouldn't just coast and that I would make sure that I would make the best use of what was in front of me. Um, so then I could give back and, and help others. So I also started volunteering with my local council um, as a, a youth advocate there. So we were running events, um, we're hosting forums. So for example, I, uh, I was the co-host of a community forum on mental health for young people. So we got uh, Headspace and Helping Minds and, and a few other local community organizations on there. Um, so that, that internship there really helped me a lot, I think, in terms of developing my, my emotional intelligence, but, but also just realizing, like changing my perspective. And so I'm really grateful for that experience. At the same time as I was going through that, I also um, applied for, applied to study abroad. Mm. So I applied to study in Indonesia. Um, under the a teachers program so that that's sponsored by the new colombo plan through dfat and basically the the structure was you'd go away you'd spend two weeks in uh, a classroom doing intensive language courses for half the day and then the other half of the day uh for the business program which which i enrolled in or applied for you'd be going on field trips visiting different startups uh, having different guest speeches, uh, speakers come in from, say, VC or just business in general and, and give lectures. And then the next four weeks, you'd spend doing an internship. Uh, so coming into that, uh, I was very lucky, say, to have that experience. Um, I flew out. I remember I was, at a, I was at a music festival on New Year's Eve. Um, I got to see... Tyler the Creator, I was very, very happy. I uh, got to spend my New Year's Eve with him. <laughs> and then um, I left the festival, got a lift home, uh, got uh, packed, had a shower, maybe an hour's sleep, and then went to the airport and flew out. So it was a great start to my New Year's. Um, I spent about seven weeks over in Indonesia, and I was fortunate enough to intern at... Um, a, a section of the University of Indonesia. Um, so it's like a, a research unit attached uh, and stationed on campus at the Uni of Indonesia. Um, and that was once again, really eye-opening. Uh, it's always perspective shifting to go into a new country, um, but it was even better for me, I felt like to have a full immersive program where you, you learn a language, um, you really get to learn about how business works in that country. Um, and then through the time I spent in that internship, um, I did a research project on the Indonesian-Australian trade agreement. Um, and that, I think, really gave me a bit of a holistic understanding, not only of um, how, how the business system in Indonesia worked, 
but I built a lot of skills in terms of cultural understanding. And there's some funny stories in there about problems I ran into. That's amazing. And I, I, um, I do remember some of these funny stories from our, I think maybe our interview practices. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you like to share any of them? <laughs> yeah, there's, so there's a phrase in Bahasa, um, which is <laughs> jam karat, right? Uh, which I believe literally translates to time as rubber. Um, so, so it's very flexible, right? Yeah. So there was a few instances where um, I would schedule something with my supervisor in Indonesia. I'd say, hey, let's have a meeting. Let's catch up. Um, I'm a bit lost on this part. I want to go over it with you so um, I can get some feedback on what I've done and more clearly plan what I have to, what the rest of the work I have to do. So I set up a meeting with her one day um, and then I, I go into the uni, I'm waiting there. Um, it's probably about an hour since we set up the meeting and I just send her a WhatsApp message to say, Hey, like, how are you? Like, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and like what's going on sort of thing. I word it in a much more polite way. Um, and, and she replied an hour later saying, Oh, sorry, traffic is terrible. Uh, I'm not gonna make it in Jamkarat, <laughs> and so um, this happened. I think she cancelled on me like two or three days in a row, um, and then I, I was actually starting to get personally offended. Um, <laughs> before I talked to some of the other people, there were some people that were doing their law practicum. They rocked up at the Supreme Court or whatever it is over there, um, and apparently they'd all rocked up there at 8 a.m. Um, I was supposed to start at 8am so some of them had gotten there at 7.30 and whatnot, um, and then no one came to collect them until lunchtime so they were waiting there for like 4 hours and they said oh but it was okay because they brought food <laughs> that's so funny um, so after, after hearing about that um, and after finding out that my colleague really really like loves uh, Indonesian food uh, the next time I said, hey, let's have a meeting. I'm like, I really want to learn uh, more about uh, Indonesian food. How about you choose a place we can go to lunch and you can uh, like show me a dish or like, like I'll order a dish that you recommend so I can learn more about that. And after connecting with her on, on a mutual interest like that um, and knowing that she never missed lunch, uh, everything went smooth from there. Never misses lunch. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Uh, fantastic. And... Um, so just a, a couple of questions I would have, I think, if I was a student or a graduate looking at this, I'd think, how did you get these two experiences? So you, you, the, the research one in, in Indonesia, you applied for that? Mm, so these, these two, um, I would say that these are experiences that sort of run through, my, uh, through the, the university. Um, so the teacher's program, any, mm. any Australian university student can apply for. Um, it's you actually get one or two units of your degree credited by going on this program, mm. um, depending on your university. And you also uh, receive, if eligible, some financial backing from the Department of Foreign Affairs to help cover some of the costs um, of going to another country to study. So because it was a, sort of a government program like that, it's not very competitive <clears throat> um, compared to, say, the roles I was applying for previously. So. Um, that, that was for the overseas experience. The, the second experience, uh, the one through the McCusker Charitable Foundation, um, it, it is somewhat competitive, but I believe if you look at the, um, the successful application rate, you're, it's probably still a lot higher than lots of private internships. Um, many of my friends and even myself applied for that exact same thing. Um, and didn't make it through the first time we applied, but made it through the second time we applied. Um, so based on that very small and mm -hmm. biased so, uh, selection sample, I'd say, you know, they probably have a 30 to 50% acceptance rate, which is significantly higher than um, most of the roles you'd apply for. So because they're sort of run through the university, um, they've kind of, you can talk to tons of people who've done them. They've got large cohorts. You sort of know that there's a higher chance of getting one of these. And I would say that they're sort of like a, an easy win to get experience mm -hmm. and to get something on your CV and to talk about in interviews. And they gave me a lot of content and also allowed for a lot of self-development for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that were the best first experiences I could have had. 
Okay, great. So, so a, a bit of a tip here, I guess, for people watching this is just keep an eye out on the opportunities available at your university and maybe what keep in touch with the careers team or something like that. Yeah, I think both of these I find out just through in emails that went through my student email, usually the ones that I delete straight away without looking at. Um, and in fact, I might have even deleted one of them and then a friend told me she was doing it and I thought, oh, that sounds cool. Why didn't I get the email about that? Um, but I think I had. <laughs> okay, sweet. And so, so now we're getting to kind of end of second year. You've turned things around a little bit. You've kind of sought more of, more of this personal development, professional development, and you've got two easy, well, not easy, but quick wins. Um, mm -hmm. So you didn't have to go through the applying online against, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of other people. It was kind of a bit more of a targeted, simpler approach. Got some wins on the board. And now you're coming into what? Final year. Year three. And so how, how did year three look for you? Yeah. Um, so when I was in Indonesia, it would have been January, February. I also, I was very lucky to have a roommate over there who was really into... Um, really far and long his career like development journey I, I would say um he for example been already had internships under his belt um he'd already like he had, had, had a great gpa because he knew that that's what he wanted to do um and he'd also already been reaching out and had relationships with different campus recruiters and, and had a role at a student society that was um accounting based he, he wanted to do accounting um, so because of all that, I was in a room with this guy and it really made me look at myself and I asked him lots of questions. I was really fortunate to have lots of his spare time or a fair bit of his spare time to um, bounce some ideas off him. And that's when I think I realised that it would probably be best for me at that stage to start like, applying for, for roles. But because my average from my first and second year was, I think, I'd say around the 60 to 65, um, it would make sense to go for an add-on degree afterwards just to give myself more time. So I decided that I would try pursue honours for economics um, at my particular university that required getting a minimum of 80% in all your economics units in your third year. Um, fortunately, it's not it wasn't averaged over say first second and third year um and because of that i just decided i'd go really hard at that um and that would give me an extra year to try get some internships because they, they say you should only apply for your internships or for your penultimate year um and that would give me some more experience so i could land a, a better grad job um so then the approach in my third year of uni was really focused on those economics units um, and then also apply for both internships and grad roles at the same time because I'd keep applying for grad roles and if I got one, I wouldn't pursue the honours and then I'd keep applying for internships because if I got one of those, I'd do the internship, have that experience and then go do a fourth year. Um, uh, an alternative take on this, if you're a student and you're coming into your third year and you know, you've maybe in a similar position to me you sort of now realize what you want to do and think uh, maybe there's a gap between your current skills and the skills that are required for the sort of roles you want is you can move to part-time um, as well and just extend your graduation I think that vocational experience uh, is very important and that's what you really get from internships so there's lots of ways you sort of hack your degree in that sense. Um, and then the approach I took was to do an honours uh, because if you do an honours degree, um, for my course, that was a standalone degree, the one year. Um, and then as soon as you have, if you, if you do really well at honours and get a first class, as soon as you have a first class honours, um, my undergraduate degree grades are a bit more redundant than the final year. That's why lots of people do a master's as well. They might really close through their bachelor's, realise what they want to do, choose a master's. Maybe they were studying, um, say, uh, marketing, and then they realised 
or, or even something unrelated like psychology and then they realize that they like finance then they go do the masters in finance not only does that allow you to get more specific um training it also allows you to reset your gpa effectively um and it gives you a you can you can paint a good story around that anyway so that's that's as i was going into my third year that was that was the strategy um use the third year to one make sure i got into that honors program and then two also apply for graduate internship programs simultaneously and see how i went from there and at this point did you have any more clarity about where you wanted to go because i the reason i'm asking this is because i remember there was a point i think uh, I can't remember exactly when it was, but you decided I really want to go into this corporate finance thing. Mm. And I, I'm trying to pin down when did you figure that out? Was it then? Yeah. Was it later on? That's a good question. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was entering in my third year, and because I'd just done a research internship at a not for profit, followed by a, an economic research internship, um, and I was pursuing economic honours. I think in my mind, I thought uh, being an economist sounds awesome, right? I, 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 but then I took a step back and I also got a professional coach um, who was a really great guy. Um, <laughs> he it's Mackenzie. Um, and and, I, and I, I looked at what I really liked about research and I really liked the being analytical um, and being diligent. I think those were the, the key aspects of that that I enjoyed. And I really liked working with numbers, um, but I realized that I like le- working with financial numbers even even more um, because it also ties into that entre- entrepreneurial spirit um, that's sort of always been there for me. So at the start, I think my approach was, you know, maybe I want to get into an infrastructure role at a big four. Um, I want, I'd love to get into anything economics related um, I didn't really necessarily understand the finance world. So that all changed, I would say, when I was working at my role in a baby retailer one day um, and there was a gentleman that came in to buy a car seat. Um, so through, through my role in a baby retailer, I think, I think it was really awesome because everyone there was sort of in that demographic where they had their career life sort of sorted for, for the most part, or at least a significant amount of them. Uh, parents and whatever can be any age. Um, but I just happened to run into a large demographic of people who'd been doing their specific career for a while and they were able to reflect on that. Um, and I used the opportunity to, to network every now and then. Um, hmm. Anyway, so, so one day, uh, I was helping a gentleman, he was looking at the car seats and this guy looked at the car seats in a different way to all the other customers that just had me intrigued. He was looking at them, he was peeling back the materials to look at the type of plastics they were molded out of. Um, He was picking them up and putting them upside down to look at any marks that were underneath. Um, And just so you know, like the average parent to be looking at a car seat, looks at it, feels it, does it feel soft? Um, most of them don't even like touching the product. They're just sort of standing one and a half meters socially distance back from the car seat and just stare at it. But no, th- this guy was giving it all. I'm like, what's with this guy? Like, he's, he's um, you know, like he really, really actually cares about uh, this. And so I walk up to him and I was like, hey, mate, um, how you going? Are you an engineer? And, and then he said, oh, that's actually funny you ask. Um, I studied engineering but I do finance now, like wh- what makes you say that? And then I explained, you know, the way that you're, you're looking at the car seats, you're looking at it like a very analytical engineer person, uh, person who I, I think would have done engineering has. Um, and it went into a conversation. He told me he was in corporate finance and used to be an investment banker. Um, I read a bit about corporate finance, but I didn't really have any exposure uh, to it up until then. Um, but anyway, so I helped him with the car seat, um, and he seemed really happy because the next time he came into the store, he, uh, had his wife and his mother-in-law 
Um, he walked into the store, he came up and found me, and then he was like to them, oh, this is the guy that I was telling you about that really helped me with the car seat. So I could tell that I would really built some rapport with him or he, he felt pretty satisfied by, by his customer service or by my customer service. Um, so we got to talking again and I mentioned that I was interested in like say pursuing an entrepreneurial venture but I, I wasn't too sure where I wanted to be at, in my career at that point um, and he was fortunate enough to catch up for coffee with me at one point um, and since then since meeting him uh, I've started to do a lot more research into the corporate finance world um, I read a book about Tim Schwarzman um, who founded I never remember if it's Blackrock or Blackstone off the top of my head <laughs> uh, they come from the same parent company the the, the PE giant um, and uh, I'd been reading a bit more into what people in corporate finance do and it sounded a fair bit more interesting to me than being an economist um, so when I came to him I had a ton of questions prepared and I was really interested and I was really lucky because we had coffee at his office um, he was running a firm at, at that time and then he took me in and he gave me sort of the 101 of everything corporate finance. Uh, he went through exactly how, say, a sell-side uh, m and transaction would work, um, how a pitch deck got put together, what technical skills, how, how to do modeling and valuation, what technical skills I needed to put together, uh, to, what level I needed to get to, to apply for a role in corporate finance. Um, and honestly, I'm so grateful he took all that time because that just gave me not only a lot of, a lot of confidence, um, but it also gave me a lot of clarity on exactly what I needed to work on. Um, and after, after having that experience, I decided that corporate finance was definitely more suited to me, the skills and what sort of work I wanted to do. So I was really grateful that I had that and um, I had him sort of mentor me through that. That's fantastic. And so it's, it's kind of, um, that was the moment where everything became a bit clearer, I suppose, for you. Mm, yeah, I think um, in my mind, I'm like, I, I want to be do something analytical. Um, I want to do something, you know, with numbers. Uh, I like, I like, um, I like businesses. What what should I do? Um, but I also have this economic skill set, and then I realised that it was very translatable to finance mm. and uh, to corporate finance in particular. And corporate strategy seems very interesting. And then there was a bit of a wrap around sometimes with consulting. Um, and when I say consulting, I mean specifically how you can improve business operations um, and answer, say, strategic questions in business. Should we enter X market, acquire Y company, pursue Z development? Um, and those things just all really appealed to me. Fantastic. And this is kind of big, what beginning of third year. This all, this all happened. Yeah, so I think I would have run into um, this this banker. I can't remember if it was towards. I think it might have been at, at the start of the year or something like that. Um, and then I'd, I'd gone away, did, done a bit of my own research. Um, I think he'd given me a recommendation to read something. Um, so I made sure that I read that and had notes and then had questions prepared. I find that anytime someone mentions something, that you, you interact with someone, anytime they mention something or they give you a recommendation, 100% follow that up and 100% come back with questions because next time you see them, if you bring that up and you show that you've taken their advice on board, <coughs> on board uh, you're going to build a lot of rapport with them because they're going to see that you've shown that initiative but also that you value their, their word. Um, or you value their advice. So they're gonna perhaps offer more time or be more open to spending more time with you. Um, but yeah, from that, that's when I decided, yeah, corporate finance. And I would say that was about the middle of the year, third year. Awesome, and that's a really good point that you brought up as well. It's, um, it's really interesting, isn't it, how most students and grads, I think we were talking about this before the call as well, 
they don't think that the uh, they don't think they have any value to give or value to to bring when they're connecting with these you know say someone like yourself now working at a, at a good company in a good role or even someone senior like a ceo but you can bring value i mean like for you providing that exceptional customer service being interested asking for advice and then following up on the advice actually taking it you know noting it down and implementing it that actually in itself is is value um, you know you're showing that you, you care and it gives them also in a roundabout strange way it does give them a an, a an opportunity to contribute and give back to society which is also like a really good feeling so that's a really really interesting point is there anything else that you'd like to mention about uh, the that relationship and how you built it or do you think you've covered it mostly in what you said before no i think that provides a good um overview like you can run into these people anywhere like um, even if you don't have, say, a retail job where you happen to run into some lots of professionals, um, I, I mentioned earlier, I think I might have touched on, I ran into, uh, I was out on a night out um, and I ran into a corporate lawyer and followed up with him, had a nice conversation, followed up with him and had a coffee with him. And I find that lots of these people are very generous with their time and they want to give back because many of them also were very fortunate to have someone when they were a student or or maybe even starting off early in their career, someone's given them a break at some point and they're incredibly grateful for that and anyone who's been in that situation wants to pay it forward, I, I feel. Um, and that's sort of ties to the human experience. Everyone wants to help everyone else out and add value to others. Uh, they just want to make sure that they're doing it in a, to award someone who's going to appreciate that um, and take the initiative to make the most <coughs> of that advice and, and implement it um and i'm sure that you feel the same definitely definitely and it does actually feel it's hard because i think a lot of students and graduates don't really they, they've never obviously they haven't usually uh, been able to get a job or they haven't worked before in that field so they don't really know how it feels to be in the inverse position but it is fantastic i mean you we were talking about it before you know if people reach out to you now you do your best to to help them out and same with me when i was back at you know working at these kinds of companies i i felt um i don't know it felt quite kind of exhilarating getting reached out to by someone saying hey uh, like can we chat you've done some awesome work and then meeting up with them and helping them and people are definitely i think on average more generous than you think but in saying that have you this is probably I'm, I'm assuming this has happened to you i'm pretty sure but have you ever reached out to someone and they haven't been willing to help you out they haven't responded yeah i, I mean there, there's sometimes you'll reach out to someone and you'll just get no response you'll follow up say two three times and then at the end of that i i thought that the third time is probably when i just stopped contacting someone but you've actually um shared some research that say that you're that you have more chance getting a response rate on the 10th contact than the 5th? Is that right? Not quite, but there is quite a bit of research that shows if you do send cold messages to people, so people, obviously you don't actually know personally, otherwise it wouldn't quite make sense. But if it's cold and mm -hmm. you reach out t 10 times, you follow up 10 times, you still get a substantial amount of responses on that 10th time. So each that each follow-up actually does get a percentage of additional response, which is really interesting. And one of the, they have different results in each of these different um, studies, but one of them was quite interesting. It kind of was really high for the first one. And then it kind of dropped down, I think, to like the sixth. Then the sixth one, I think there was a bump. It started bumping back up and then it would go down again. And you can see this as well with, because having i don't know if this is apply i don't know if you've done more than three or so follow-ups but i've seen people who have done more follow-ups than that and they'll go from getting absolutely no response to someone's saying even ceo say i'm so sorry i'm really sorry i haven't responded to you you know let's catch up tomorrow and they've actually made them an offer within like a few days of that chat crazy stuff so yeah it's definitely worth it i mean there is a right way to go about it obviously that's and that's I was talking to someone yesterday as well who's in recruitment 
and we were talking about how there is a right and a wrong way of doing this stuff. Um, I shared a, a video a little while ago about the most important variables, in my opinion, for getting a job. And one of them was getting that dis- decision maker attention. And I was kind of talking through this with, with this recruiter and she was saying, yeah, it's um, definitely you need to do that at some point. Otherwise, they can't hire you. They can't make a good decision. But a lot of people just do it badly. So I think if you follow up in a nice way and, and the follow up technique that you might, may or may not remember that we use is kind of it, it's, it's hard to be angry at that follow up. It's just so lovely. You can't really be angry at it. So if you got, if you can nail that it that down, why not follow them up ten times? I mean, worst case they don't respond. <laughs> yeah. Typically, yeah, just no, to I... clarify, we do usually stop at. I recommend usually stopping around three or four. <laughs> uh, but you can go more. You can go more. Mm. Yeah, following up is interesting. I I I think um, I do remember following someone up and not getting a response for two months, uh, and I was just following up. I think it was. Uh, Send the initial one one week later, and then I think it went to three weeks later, then four weeks later, or, or something like that. And on, on that fourth reply, a little while after that, I just got a response. And um, usually, people didn't mind at all. They, they were just saying, you know, being busy. And I can now see the other side of that. If someone reaches out to me, um, and I, I just really don't like have a lot going on, it might take me say a week to reply. Um, and that's not because I don't want to help the person. And then you can really see why someone might forget about that. And then a follow up is actually helpful for them. So, hundred percent, a hundred percent. Sweet. Okay. So year three, you're kind of starting all this stuff. You got this little mentor in corporate finance, essentially. You've done some. It has got some experience. Your grades are starting to lift. Trying harder in that area, and you're hoping to get into economics honors. Anything else interesting happen in this particular year? Did you apply to any more jobs or try and get any more internships? Mm. Um, so I think it would have been maybe, what, March or so I became a client of yours, April. I remember coming back from Indonesia, um, thinking about everything that I'd learned about, say, job searching, thinking about all my conversations with my roommate from Indonesia, um, and also listening to a few different podcasts um and on one of them you know I, I just really started to learn the value of a coach right um you don't see any elite sports athletes that don't have a coach right um and that that also translates to all other areas in life like nearly every executive has their executive coaches um if you want to go to the gym you can go to the gym by yourself get great results Um, but having someone spot you, having someone check and keep you accountable, um, having someone, you know, just there, make sure you're measuring your progress, uh, a PT or any sort of fitness coach, you're going to get better results. Um, there's also the unknown unknowns, like you don't know what you don't know. And someone who's, you know, gone through and blazed that trail before, they will be able to see these unknown unknowns for you, um, your blind spots maybe, and and help you realize them, fix them, and be more effective. Um, Basically, getting a coach is just like a shortcut, right? And that's incredibly valuable, especially if you were in my shoes and you were hoping to, um, you know, go from an uncompetitive candidate to a competitive candidate um, over the course of that time. So I signed up with uh, McKenzie, um, very, very fortunate I found him um, and I started implementing his, your, your system as well um, and I started getting a few wins around there where I was making it to, well, first of all, I got my first interview and then I was making it to my the first like final rounds of interviews at several different roles. Um, over the course of my third year, I also started entering finance competitions because up until that point, I just had an economics degree. Um, and no finance exposure. And after after meeting the, this this banker, I realized, wow, like there's there's so much more I need to build. How do I build these modeling skills? How do I build um, pitch deck skills? Like how do I 
build so how can I show that I can work into it work in a team towards a very tight deadline um, so I entered in a stock pitch competition with some friends as well as a corporate finance um, competition that was being hosted by a large restructuring firm as well um, so those two experiences gave me something to talk about but also really helped me build those finance skills that I hadn't learned through my uh, study at uni as well so I'd say one like having a coach massive difference that meant I now had a system that I could implement rather than building my own system through trial and error going in <laughs> bumping around in the dark and then when I bump into things you know fixing it then uh, secondly realizing that finance is what I wanted to do finding my gaps and then entering competitions which also are great on the CV but um, help me build those skills um, and then finally just having some confidence because I had a system in place where I was uh, applying for different positions that I was excited about and being able to get further and further um, through that process was something that just kept me motivated. So identifying those gaps kind of to polish yourself off as of getting becoming so basically you went from kind of going from year one kind of having fun chilling out year two starting to get your head in the game year three was all about okay i'm here awesome candidate is here breach that gap coach other technical skills acquiring those through comps and, and courses i think you've done as well other reaching out and talking to other potential mentors and things like that kind of mm. Yeah, and then um, also, um, I think I implemented a completely new system for studying. Um, mm. I, I made sure I learnt, I, I learnt about like space repetition, um, active recall, all those really highly effective memory techniques and studying techniques that I didn't know about. Um, and I didn't know about them because I never thought, hang on, instead of just studying the way I know how, why don't I step back and spend a week researching about the best ways to study, the most effective way, because um, I don't think, I don't even know, I may have gotten one HD um, up until that point in my uni academic life. And now I needed to reach, I think, three or four of them to get into honours. So how do you do that? Um, and there were a few things that I learned, I guess, that also helped me academically really accelerate and become a more effective person. Um, that even timetabling, scheduling, just being better at scheduling really be making better use of your time and resources it's fantastic and i think from memory you although you you got you ended up spoiler alert got into honors but um you got an offer right mm, and yes <laughs> yeah how, how what was that like because most people right if they get an offer at a pretty decent company kind of in a pretty good spot graduate and I'm, please explain this in a second, but mostly they would just accept in. Mm, yeah, so I, I got an offer at a Fortune 500 company that um, uh, when going into it, I thought it was my dream role um, and I turned it down. So here's why. Um, <laughs> Sounds like an ad or something. <laughs> no, I'm just going to leave you guys there. That's, here's that's why. That's a quick hangout. This is the end of the episode. Um, we'll, we'll, get, we'll tell you what next episode. See you on Brooks' podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so the, there was this role. Um, it was at an automotive manufacturer. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I was really into cars. I loved cars. loved driving cars. Um, I was heavily involved with the car club at my university I uh, ran that for a while um, just it's just a, a passion of mine um, and so I thought what, what better to blend two passions than uh, take apply for a finance role at an automotive manufacturer um, and I think my passion for all things cars motorbikes um, on wheels shone through because when we were doing case studies um, in the interview process, doing group interviews, I was able to say, talk about why you might want to manufacture different components on, of a car in different countries and, and other risks that might be involved in that um, in a way that just came from already having industry knowledge. Um, but going through that, there, there was one, there was a couple things that came out 
Um, because the HR knew that I was really into cars, one thing that they were telling me about when they were really selling this role to me was that if you, Brooke, if you get this role, um, we will provide you with a brand new 2021 our brand car, sports car, um, with, with fuel, maintenance, uh, and insurance all included. And for a price that worked out to be about, what, I think it was around under $100 a week out of your salary. Um, and I thought, this is awesome, right? Um, so this role, I made it through to the final rounds. And actually, when I was doing the final round interviews, I was... Um, on holiday in Esmouth, uh, in WA. So that is, uh, I guess, tropical. <laughs> so one time I was, um, I was doing my interview and I was actually at the beach because we were just driving up there in, in my car. Um, and I just had to like choose a spot where I knew there would be good reception. Um, and it, it was at, it was at this beach, so I was outside doing it, and I had the palm trees and the beach in my background. And uh, one of, one of the people interviewing me was asking me like, "Mate, is that a Zoom background?" Or and I'm like, "No, I, I moved it around and showed them." You know, I explained the context that I happened to be on a holiday, but um, <laughs> I made sure that you know I, I could still do these interviews because I didn't want to miss them because the role was really important to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, that, that's just an aside. So I was fortunate enough to progress to the final round. Um, I received a call from HR uh, offering me this position. And um, there, there was a few things. I asked them to send me over the, the contract. And then I also asked, um, you know, can you tell me more about the perks included in this role, including, say, the, the company car that was mentioned earlier on? Um, at this point, after just receiving the offer, I was then told that, um, Brooke, you know, you get your car at the end of your probation period and your probation period is two years with us. Uh, and I thought, <laughs> I thought, wow, okay. So I feel like I've been, they're taking the mickey out of me here. Um, and if this is something that I feel like HR has sort of led me on um, and lied about and they're expecting me to move to another state to to work for them um what are the risks involved here and what else might i you know have been painted a rosier picture about than i was previously told um the salary was very competitive so i was considering taking the offer anyway um but because i sort of had the backup of getting into honors um I, i'd finished on a competitive average the cutoff for the previous year, I was told, was an average of 83%, and I'd finished on an average of a few percentage points above that. So I thought that I would turn down the roll and risk it and just go. I didn't find out whether or not I got into honours until four weeks later. <laughs> so those whole four weeks, I thought, you know, have I made a mistake here? What if I don't get into honours and now I've got no backup plan and I've got to go back to square one of interviewing? Um, but fortunately enough, it was the right decision. I made it into the honors program, um, and looking at, back on it, it was it was the right decision to turn down that role. Uh, even though you know it would have been a fantastic role, and I met some of the team that they seemed great. It's just I was um, a bit put off how how the say process was run, um, and it left a bit of a sour taste. I wasn't sure I it broke my trust with that and starting starting uh, an employment relationship when you don't trust your employer it's probably not a good thing to do in the first place um in saying that there's there's probably lots of strategies for grads to do this i've, I've heard of grads talking about you just accept the offer and then renege later on or you never never turn down an offer unless you already have another backup plan which is an offer in hand um, I didn't play that game at that time, but there are lots of those strategies that grads do do use, and um, I don't know. There, there might be some positives. Have, have you heard of say grads um, saying yeah or, or keeping an offer in hand and then using this to negotiate for a second offer? Like, tell me about your experience. 
Hmm. Yeah, I have. I mean, typically, like, my experience is people do do it. I mean, if you get two or three offers that are, you know, quite good, and maybe, for example, recently I had someone get an offer that was very, well, a couple of offers that were really good. One of them they actually liked more. They liked the job more, but the other salary was way higher. So they tried to, for example, you know, try and get them to go into me in the middle. But I think, yeah, it's, there's a lot of different things that you can try. Um, I think my view is usually uh, to... I think I've, I've got a f few kind of values that I like to just uphold what, you know, with whatever I'm doing. So I like to be honest and upfront with people. But if, if there's an opportunity you know, to negotiate, then, then why not? I think it's just how you do it. But yeah, I, think, I, think, I also think you made the right decision. I do remember we actually had a phone call at the time and you were really not sure about it. And I was, I was thinking, oh, that sounds like a really good job. I don't know if you definitely want to do that, but you know, you, you made it work out. So well done. Yeah, yeah, actually, I do remember calling you like um, 20 minutes after, after getting off the phone with HR. And um, I, I started writing down, you know, like a SWOT analysis of this offer for me in my position. <laughs> and then, then I called Mackenzie and I'm like, Mackenzie, what do I do here? You know, like, um, my, my gut's telling me that this is a bad decision or, or whatnot, but I've got this shiny new object syndrome that's telling me I really want to take this job, you know? Um, so I think, I think, uh, the sensible decision was there in the end and you're right before you never ever want to leave. You never want to damage your, your reputation. Um, I, I think that that's, that's probably integrity is very important to uphold. So you shouldn't necessarily, I'm not talking about leading employers on, um, but I am talking about, you know, you sometimes do have those tough decisions where you might have, you know, two, two, two decisions, two, which, which lead down completely different paths that are irreversible. So how do you make the most in, in navigating that sort of complex and un uncertain situation? Mm, definitely. Okay, sweet. So you got that offer, turn it down, even though you thought, like if you looked maybe two years back and you thought, wow, if I could get this job at this company and doing what I love, plus what I love, plus what I love, plus get a thing to drive that I love and get paid well, that's going to be great. But then you actually had, it almost seems like you had so much self-aware, or, or you know, a lot more self-awareness than you maybe you had before and you knew that, you know, actually, this isn't quite cut it and I know I can do better than this as well and so yeah that was amazing I, I was actually really uh, I was happy although I was kind of upset that you I guess turned it down like a little bit I was kind of like oh like, that was such a good opportunity I do I was very happy that you came to that conclusion because it was it was clear that you thought about it really really hard and um, obviously now you're in a role which I imagine is is a preferable one yeah yeah i think um maybe that was the other thing that i actually didn't touch on earlier yeah um it, i thought it was a finance role and as i was walking through it it sounded like um it was it was more of the um let's say bookkeeping projects management maybe type of accounting i don't know it, it was it was way more say accounting and finance rather than finance and strategy mm. um so as i learned more about that because um I didn't find that out during the interview stage, but after getting the offer, I believe I called two of the managers of two different divisions, which I thought I was likely to be placed in. And I asked them what they did day to day and what, what their, what their new, um, sort of grads did day to day and what sort of work they did. And it wasn't until I got, I guess, took the initiative to, to go do that, email these people cold and give them a call. Then did I actually find out maybe what I was getting myself into and that's probably a bit of a reflection on me it's bad for me for not doing that earlier perhaps um I think being someone who just you know I, I'm a grad I want a job maybe you're a bit maybe I was a bit uh had a bit of a funnel focus on the offer um and it took a lot of conviction and perhaps I should have done more research into what that actual role entailed um because I, I thought it was Slightly different to what it was, I believe. 
Mm, that's a really good point as well. And it's, I think someone like yourself, you're actually very, I think you, over time, especially as you go into second, third year, you actually had a pretty good understanding of yourself and, and what you wanted to, to get and what was out there in the market as well and what it kind of looked like. Uh, and obviously your, your understanding of what was available just got better and better and better. But so many graduates I speak to are just so far away from understanding what is out there. They literally see, like, they'll see a job advertised on Seek or something, and it says business analyst. And they go, oh, I have a business analyst analysis degree. I'm just going to apply. I'm a great fit. But then they have no idea what actually, what, what the role actually entails. And so for, like, for you, you realize that thing. And that was, yours is a bit different because it was maybe sold in a different way. But... And you found out towards the back end, but a lot of these people, they'll kind of apply and wonder why they're not getting through. But it's it, if they actually understood what the role was about, they would be like, oh, well, of course. Like, Why would they hire me for that? That's silly. Um, so that's a really good point you raised as well. It is, I, and, and personally, that's... I know this, this isn't about me, but I just my two cents on this with everyone that I've helped with this process is that I think definitely as you're getting exposure at the beginning sure like do whatever like just get some exposure but in the end i think typically it's much more effective to at least have some sort of focus on what you're looking for and to really understand what that is Uh, and you can always like pivot that focus right like you might go i really want to be in corporate finance and in two years you might go actually i actually really want to be in strategy consulting and you might pivot that focus but in my experience when people are more focused they understand what they're going for in more detail they tend to get better results as well. Yeah, my two cents. Anything else you'd like to say with that one? No, no, I, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. But like, you know, grads, no one can be too hard on themselves because we all start in that position where we just don't know. Um, and, you know, it, it's, especially in lot, lots of places, I think um, firms are really trying hard now to sort of give you a snapshot of what day-to-day life in their firms are like for grads especially all the bigger companies. Um, so it just takes a while and takes talking to people to be able to really picture what you would be doing between waking up and going home from work at different jobs and work out what aligns to what you want. Um, even if you know exactly what the jobs entail, it's also very hard to know what you like doing if you haven't done, say, internships, if you haven't done things that are very similar, right? Like, do you actually like you know, working late nights or not? Um, how, how, how lifestyle driven are you in terms of your schedule? Um, and what sort of teammates do you like working with? Like, or, yeah, what sort of people you like working with? These are very niche things that can really make or break jobs or two positions that seem identical for, for certain people. 100%, 100%. And yeah, if, if I didn't make it, it was also clear before as well. Uh, Obviously, if you don't, if you don't really know what it is that you you want to do, and you're not clear on that, then it's just trial and error, really. Until and up until that point, it's like, and, and you, me and you, we both have both had very similar journeys. I mean, if you look at our LinkedIn's, they're actually <laughs> not too dissimilar now. Economics, economics, tons of random internships and experiences, <laughs> like running this random business, this random business. Both get grad jobs, and so it's for me especially, it was about just trial and error like I, I thought I wanted to do commercial property got an internship very quickly realized that I didn't uh, yeah. data analysis did I want to do that not really but it was good skill banking oh, I didn't really want to do that that much uh, more the government sector side of things are oh, not really so and the same for you I'm sure so I think it, it is yes it's great to have a focus and, and know what you want more specifically but it's pretty impossible if you have no data points, right? It's almost like a machine learning algorithm. You're like, <laughs> you're like, you show this machine, you're like, is this, <laughs> is this good? And they just go yes, but they've never seen like what a cup is or what cup is good. They they can't know if it's good or not, so they just will be confused. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. Actually, <laughs> you, you just jogged my memory. When I was in my um, second year or so. I remember I thought I, because I was like, okay, maybe I do like the finance thing. Like I'm an entrepreneurial person. Um, I love economics, but maybe finance is for me. 
And then I'm like, okay, so how about um, mortgage broking? That seems like it's finance, right? Like that's as finance as you can get. So I actually started studying a diploma of mortgage broking. Oh, really? While, while I didn't doing know that. My, yeah, I was halfway through. I, I'm almost qualified. Yeah, I almost was qualified as a mortgage broker. I was, I had uh, one more exam to sit. But then, um, then I realized that wasn't for me because I met a mortgage broker at, once again, my retail job, started talking to him, um, followed up with him, had coffee with him. And then I'm like, hang on a second, I don't like this role. <laughs> um, and, and so I went down another rabbit hole. Yeah, then I met the lawyer and then, and then yeah, found, finally found when I, when I talked to that banker, oh, this is, this is what I thought I wanted. Mm. Yeah, it's so fascinating, isn't it? so fascinating cool alright and so I know you've been doing this for a while give a few more minutes yeah whatever what's the time it's been about an hour it's ten minutes oh okay yeah you might have to you might have to cut some down hey <laughs> so so yeah the, well, the last couple of things I wanted to cover was how, first how'd you get this job because I know you got some fine around interviews I think at this company it may be a some a big four you got a final round interview any other final round interviews that you got that you can remember was it just those two and then obviously the job you got so three mm. so going into my fourth year mm. uh, right at the end of my third year i applied for a scholarship with this economic um economic think tank uh, mm. I, I guess you'd, you'd say it um it's the man cow organization they're based here in in wa and they're, they're awesome because they, they take on uni students uh, and they've got what they call a leadership development program. Um, they will give you networking opportunities um, with, with, I guess, different business people. Uh, they were taking people on to do entrepreneurial boot camps. Uh, we went on a leadership development camp that was run by, it was maybe like 10 or so people who were at SAS, mm. um, one guy who was a SEAL and one guy who worked in uh, MI5 or MI6, and they ran this leadership development camp for us. And God, that was uh, I was very tired by the end of that. That was a crazy weekend. Um, and a few other things like that, like we had our performance psychologists come in and give seminars on, on just how you can, I guess, build yourself up, how you can take advantage of or learn about how your brain works or or how you can use different things to say like motivation and reward or goal setting from a psychological context to be more effective um so that was really awesome so i applied for that right at the end of my third year uh funnily enough it was that lawyer that i mentioned earlier <laughs> he mentioned it to me um, and it took me a year to apply and then what i did i was like why didn't i do this last year um i did that got into honours, I uh, started a tutoring gig as well, just from one of the professors of the units that I really liked the year earlier. Um, I just reached out to him, had coffee with him, um, found out a bit more about what it was like working as an economist and being an economist. And um, I was having that coffee chat almost simultaneously as I had coffee with the banker. And that's what made me decide to sort of pivot more towards the banker. Uh, the, the sort of corporate finance side mm. um, and then yeah going to fourth year do, doing my honours really just putting a lot of time and effort into that and doing uh, doing those competitions actually sorry was at the start of the fourth year um, and then started getting into different interviews I remember there was a an economist role but at a trading firm that I made it into the final rounds in about February, March oh, of that yes, fourth year. I remember that. Um, good company, was a, wasn't it, as well? Pardon? It was a good company as well. Yeah, yeah, like in, incredibly competitive. Like mm. It would have been a phenomenal role. Um, I, I didn't get that role, and then I had a friend who applied, and uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough, I, I told him, say, who would be interviewing him, um, the sort of stuff they're looking for. He got that role. I'm, I'm really happy for him, and honestly... You know, he, he was way more suited to it. Um, it. It was, let's say, an equity research type type role, let's say. Um, so made into the final round of that at the very start. There was a restructuring firm that I made it into the final rounds of. 
um, they they turned me down because they thought I, I wasn't a good fit and that was probably the right decision because I I didn't have the intention to pursue a CA and I didn't have an accounting degree and in the restructuring world <laughs> like they, they will charge out um, consultants with a CA at a higher rate than consultants without one for example um, and I, I thought maybe the role was more corporate finance than it was restructuring. So that was probably fortunate for me that I didn't get that role and, and they made the decision to turn me down. But I didn't learn a lot. And that was the same firm that run a corporate finance competition that I'd gone through. And I got the interview by doing their corporate finance competition. As a team, um, we came first. And then from there, I'd made lots of connections at the firm. When I applied for the role, I'd already known the HR manager, I already knew one or two of the managing directors. They, they just put me straight through for the interviews. Mm. Um, so that was awesome. And then I think towards yeah, the middle of the year, there were two different roles that came up. And once again, these weren't front door applications. So the first role was um, a partner at a big floor had emailed the honours coordinate at my university saying hey we're looking for someone in um, a specific type of tax team I, I can't remember which one and at the time I was doing my honours in mining tax um, and, and assessing that so I, I received the honours coordinator forwarded this email to me I followed up with the partner and it went straight into an introductory interview with um, two consultants at that firm and then following that I had an interview very shortly after with I think it was a manager and a senior, senior manager around that level um, which would have been followed by a part in the interview had I gone ahead and then a hiring decision so that was a very straightforward process it literally was me emailing the partner replying to his email saying hey I'm Brooke, I'm interested in tax and I can prove this because I've done, say, this, uh, this honours thesis in the, in the area, uh, in the field, and here's my CV or whatnot, and then straight away saying, hey, when are you free to have coffee? Um, so that was awesome, very straightforward. And then the other role, which is my current role now at Patson Group in corporate finance, um, I was at the, one of those man-cow networking events um, so Mantel was, was the economic scholarship program that I was a part of, the leadership development program. Um, I was talking to a bunch of people. One guy I met, um, funnily enough, I'd run into him then uh, because I'd cold messaged him on LinkedIn about six months earlier mm. because I wanted to get an internship at a hedge fund here in Perth. And he'd previously interned at that hedge fund. So I reached out to him, had a phone call with him. He gave me some advice. Um, that that process never went anywhere but I ran into him at this networking event um, he remembered me I told him that I'd implemented all of his advice it was really useful um, and it was probably got me a lot further than I would have otherwise I was really grateful for that and then he asked me you know Brooke what are you doing now and what do you want to do and I said look I'm really interested in corporate finance uh, I think that after trying all these things out, this is definitely what I, do, what I want to do. Um, and then I said, you know, what do you do? And he said, oh, well, Brooke, I'm, I'm in corporate finance. Uh, would you be interested in a role at our firm? And he then introduced me via email to HR at his firm, which went straight into an interview and then into another interview. And I remember that I got the offer for Patson Group um, about two hours before I had the uh, interview with the manager and the senior manager from the big four. And, and it was on a Friday and I'm like, I can't cancel this interview, you know, a couple hours before. So I'll go in there, um, you know, I'll use the opportunity to learn a lot more about what they're doing. I also asked them some advice for my thesis because there were some tax things that I weren't sure of. And I'm like, isn't this a fantastic way to get some consulting advice without the charge out fee? Um, and I got to know the guys a lot more. They're, they're honestly a great team over there and I would have really fit in there. Um, but after hearing about you know, the work they do, the, the corporate finance role was definitely a no brainer for me. 
Um, and then I had the interview at the Big Four, got to know the guys. Um, they, they had a list of questions in front of them, and it probably wasn't until about the 45-minute mark because um, we were just talking and, and chatting casually the whole time that they looked at the first question. And then when they, they looked at the first question and went to ask me the first interview question, I informed them that I'd already received an offer, you know, a couple hours earlier from another role um, and that I was intending to take that. I really appreciated the time and I hope I didn't leave them on or leave it sour taste. And they seemed really, um, they didn't seem offended at all. Uh, in fact, they were like, well, no worries. We understand your situation. Um, that suits us perfectly. We're going to head to Friday drinks now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, and then, yeah, signed the role with Patson and I've been here for six months. Amazing. And so so how is the role at uh, at Paxson? What Because cause I, I know he's been going on for a long time in this one, but one of the things I really wanted to uh, kind of draw out of this was what's it actually like in a role like this? Because as we, we talked about before, so many people don't have a clue what specifically corporate finance consulting would be and what are the different flavors of that so for you what what is your role like what do you do day to day yeah i would say i even even though i knew known i wanted to do corporate finance um and uh that was i I was very very particular about that for let's say six to twelve months in it leading up to getting that offer um Still, day one when I started, I still wasn't certain exactly what that specific role was entailing. Um, I would say, so it it really depends on your firm. Um, One thing I would say that changes things a lot is whether or not you work for government clients or not. So the corporate finance, and also whether or not you're assigned to a product, or whether or not you're assigned to an industry. So what I mean by that is you could be assigned to a specific product. So you will see this say at the big four or an investment bank, um, you will be working say in corporate finance, but you're only doing ECM or DCM, equity capital markets or debt capital markets raising, or you'll only be doing M&A, um, or you'll only be doing uh, an, another part of that. Whereas you could be assigned also to an industry. So you might be assigned to healthcare, you might be assigned to infrastructure, you might be assigned to oils and gas and mining, for instance. Um, so at my particular firm, they were lots of our work, I think approximately 50% of the work that we get is in the healthcare industry. And um, the rest is made up of mostly infrastructure and, and a few other things relating to that. Um, and I was specifically interviewing for a role in the healthcare team. So because of that, I get a lot of different healthcare roles, uh, projects. The project breakdowns that I get um, really depend, depending on the client, I would say. So we get lots of government jobs and um, specifically governments from the Eastern states. We will be doing, say, uh, hospital development feasibilities. Um, so that is when someone, whether it's a private or a public uh, client, wants to build a specific hospital in a specific location, they'll come to us uh, and we'll work out, you know, for example, how many people live around that area, uh, what's the demographics like, what are the clinical trends in that area, what's the likelihood of how many presentations or, or what's the demand basically going to be for this hospital um, and then you know, how are you going to supply that demand? How big are you going to build the hospital? What's the capital and operating costs associated with that? What are you likely to be able to charge the client, uh, the, the patients that come in there? Um, and then effectively, how profitable is the hospital? And then if you use a discounted cash flow uh, analysis on that, is this going to give you your required rate of return or not for a private client? For a public client, you know, public hospitals, they lose money. How much is this going to cost the state, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, and then you do some qualitative cost-benefit analysis. What are the impacts of the health benefits in the area you'll have for having this hospital here versus this financial cost, which we have quantified, uh, for instance. So that would be hospital feasibility that we do. 
Um, we might also advise the state on, say, or, or a private operator on if they get an unsolicited bid or a, a bid on a, on an asset, let's just say it's a piece of infrastructure like a toll road, something like that. Um, or it could be, I don't know, a car park, something like that. Um, private fund, infrastructure fund comes along, says, hey, we want to build, uh, buy this off you, or hey, this is under a lease agreement where we have the rights to get the profit associated with this toll road or car park for the next 10 years. We want to do some changes and extend that to 20 years. And you work out, well, what's the, what's the cost associated with that? Um, what, what's the benefit and then what's the net present value of that? Should the state accept this offer or is it too low? Um, and also what's really important is what are the risks? Who is basically responsible for paying what? Um, how do these change over time? And if one of the key factors in their changes, let's say inflation, um, let's say that you're indexing the contract so the state will be paid by the private operator at X amount every year, and this goes up um, by the headline inflation. But what if the amount that they're charging people to use that toll road changes by a different amount, um, or the ability for the users to pay changes by amount that's not equal to that indexation you're using? Um, so you're looking at the risks associated with that. So that would be the, I guess, development side or the bid um assessment side uh we may also do some things just like anytime a hospital wants to do capital development they need to budget that how much is it going to cost if you want to replace a wing of this hospital or upgrade your machines that help you do surgery in in for people who are experiencing a stroke um something like that well that's going to cost you this much money What's the impact? Um, and then also what's the qualitative benefit? You know, the old machines, they're inefficient. These new machines potential might save, I don't know, an extra life a year in, in this state. So I would say being in the healthcare team, that's what lots of the work entails. It's just any time you could think of something to do with a hospital wanting to spend a fair bit of money, how do you make sure that you're getting your value for money? Um, and how do you make sure that you're doing that in a way where the risks are appropriately allocated to those best positions to handle those risks? That's a lot of the work that we do. Um, other work that we do, you know, we happen to do sell side M and A mandates. So if a company wants to basically grow or, or if the shareholders of a company want to sell a portion of their stake in the company or all of it, um, they may come to us specifically for healthcare transactions. So we did the Monster App um, transaction last year and we have another mandate at the moment. Um, so that, that was something that I didn't know that this role would have, sell side M&A mandates. Um, apart from that, I would say that there, there's also a fair bit of, say, strategy work here and there, um, some assessment work here and there, um, and it's a bit of a mixed basket of what other client, uh, what other projects you get across your desk. But that would be the bread and butter of the healthcare team at this specific firm. Sounds really exciting. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I really enjoy it. This is this is really what I wanted to do. Um, it's sort of all, all the analytics um, that, that I, I thought I always wanted uh, and I'm really lucky to, to have this role. There, there's also a fair bit of it, say, um, we have, say, a private business comes to us, they're saying, you know, we operate this healthcare business, we want to grow it like this, what's the best way to do that? So we have some strategy or growth consulting in there um, and that's even, even more exciting work. Hmm. And so in terms of what your normal day looks like, what kind of, like, what time do you get in and what, what do you do? Like, what does an average day look like for Brooke? Yeah, um, so 
I, I like waking up at, say, 6.30 odd. Um, sometimes if I'm working from home, I might wake up at 5.30 and get a 6 a.m. jiu-jitsu class in um, mm. before I go home, have a shower, eat and start. Um, start about, you know, 8, 7.40. If I'm starting at 7.30 or so, then it's usually just so I can read for a little bit before I actually start my role. Um, then between 8 and five which are the standard office hours it really just depends on the projects you have on your plate at the moment um what's urgent what's not if for example you're doing one of those feasibility assessments um the i would be doing a lot of modeling for that so i might just spend a whole day or half a day doing the modeling for that and then i might spend a couple hours writing up reports and then maybe i've got this m a project we're trying to liaise uh, with bidders and set up some meetings. So I might spend, you know, an hour uh, organising them, spend some time on the phone, something like that. Yeah, so do you liaise with clients that much, would you say? Yeah, um, look, it depends. So if you're building a model and you need some key inputs, um, then you may be working alongside uh, the, the team, say, with your client and you'll, you'll contact the person and ask for those key inputs. Um, we'll have, say, regular project update meetings. Um, as a grad at my firm, I get a fair bit of exposure to clients because I'll usually be in those meetings, um, those update meetings, and um, I'll be able to, say, contact people directly asking for inputs, stuff like that. Um, but I'm not front and center. I'm not usually their first person to contact other than with stuff directly about organizing or with models for, for certain things. Um, so it, it depends. For this m and process we have at the moment, um, I'll be doing lots of correspondence with people, say potential bidders at, at the same sort of level as me. Um, but if it's one of their partners, uh, usually partners, usually people communicate around about the same level. It just depends. Yeah, cool. Okay. And and so life now is pretty, pretty different to life when you started university, hey? <laughs> yeah, 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 of, of course. Um, well, first of all, I, I think that um, I just learned a lot about myself in that whole crazy process and mm. this isn't just relating to say careers um i think it just relates to say what sort of lifestyle you want and how you're going to get that and how what what's important to you and how you prioritize that so for me something i'm really really i care about a lot or i'm passionate about is fitness um and just trying new things so uh, for example, I'm, I've picked up jiu-jitsu this year. I think I've been doing that around about six months or so. I've been really enjoying that. Um, every now and then when I get the opportunity, I'll take my motorbike down to the racetrack and, and I'll give that a go. Um, I love going camping. Went camping last weekend with some mates, took advantage of the long weekend and um, I hike fairly regularly. And then, you know, I, I really like trying new things. So um, <laughs> a couple months back, I, I ended up going for try my first yoga session. Uh, that was really awesome. It said, I didn't know what hot yoga meant until I walked in. So um, I, I was a bit confused. I got there. Um, <laughs> everyone was taking their shirts off and, and stuff. I'm like, oh, weird, but yeah, okay, whatever. Um, and then uh, I walk in and I realize why, because it's an actual sauna. Like they've, they've got the heaters on all the way and, and that's the whole idea. And you're doing yoga in, in, a, in, a, in a really hot room. Um, that was very punishing, but very rewarding. <laughs> uh, I ended up going back like three, four more times after that. So I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I, I like trying just new things every now and then. It just adds some spice into your life. And I'm grateful that I've got a role where I just have less limitations in, in terms of doing those things. I don't feel like I'm necessarily so limited because um, the, the number one thing that's important to me, I guess, 
at this stage of my life is to build a skill set that I'll be able to monetize over the rest of my life to um, do what I want to do. And I'm able to do this alongside with living my life. So that's awesome. Mm, it really sounds like you're having having a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, you try to. Obviously, like, it, it's not always, like, rosy. Like, you, mm. there's, like, in corporate finance in particular, there's, there's long hours. So eight to five is office hours. But, you know, there will be times where you're doing sprints and, you know, you're, you're working, say, eight to eight, um, so, something like that, long hours. There's, you know, times if you don't focus on, say, your sleep or your diet or something like that, um, you can get into a bad headspace and that's important to talk about and it's just really not nice and that can also make you sort of slower at work and then you might end up working more to compensate and then, uh, say, sacrificing sleep more and maybe maybe you're going into a cycle like that. Just understanding these things and making sure that you have your body in an equilibrium your, your body and your mind uh, can really make sure that you're more effective at everything you do um, and you're more happy really I mean you've got so much to share with your you know your work your jiu-jitsu your biking your camping your entrepreneurial ideas and tactics I'm sure but you know, it's always fun to talk with you, McKenzie. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's just so much that ground that we could cover. Um, no, but I suppose what, what do you what do you want to wrap up with? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think the last thing is just uh, for you. If you could go back to your, let's say your 18 year old self, mm-hmm. going into to uni, and you could you could go back all that time, and you could you could whisper in in his ear. You could say, "Hey, Brooke." Here's a few tips for you. What would you say to him? What would you, what would you say? What would you yeah, I advice? think um, the most important thing, like for me, I think uh, your personal development is really important in that in that journey, um, and and gaining self awareness and self awareness is part of EQ. Um, but all of this, in order to really show any growth, uh, you need to be uncomfortable. So you really need to step outside your comfort zone. Um, when I go motorbike, um, I take my motorbike to the track, there's a couple of coaches there and um, they'll give us some tips. And one thing they always say is, look, you should always be pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. Um, but in motorbike racing in particular, uh, it, it can be dangerous to go, to go too far outside your comfort zone. Um, so they say, you know, get 10% better, um, focus on just doing something 10% more. Whether you're taking a corner and you want to try get your lean angle, say 10% better, or you want to try and make sure you can go 10% faster through that corner, always just focus on, on that incremental improvement and incrementally being outside your comfort zone. Um, when it comes to the times where I feel like I developed myself the most in, in that journey, it was... It was when I was sort of outside my comfort zone doing something I wasn't sure if I should really be there. Um, my very first internship, uh, I was I felt very out of place. Going to another country and interning over there, I definitely felt out of place over there. Um, and then even just signing up for for say competitions, finance competitions through uni, or just making your first application, your first job application, if something is uncomfortable to do it's probably good if you know it's towards your goal um and you should make sure you do it just don't push yourself past a critical minimum where, where you're going to crash your motorbike yeah so so okay so in summary what would your kind of little bullet point be to yourself for that one yeah always push yourself um and always do what you think that you shouldn't be doing or you can't be doing Mm. I'm not sure whether or not 18 year old with me would listen to me, yeah. but um, yeah, that's what I'd, I'd try to tell him. It's funny, isn't it? It's almost whenever you're, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? If you, it's almost every time you try and avoid something, like whenever you feel like you're avoiding something, it's almost always that's the thing that's actually going to take you there. It's, I get caught out by that all the time. I'm thinking, oh, should I do this? Should I do this? And then I think of this thing and I go, oh, maybe I won't do that. 
But really, that is actually the thing. Uh, any any other tips you would give back to your eighteen year old self, or was that the number one? Mm. Yeah, well, I think like saying being uncomfortable is one thing, but you know that it's a bit open ended. So one thing I'd say is um, set goals, right? Um, that you think. You know, set, set goals that you think are your, say, upper min- limit, and then set a goal that's 20% above that. That's your stretch goal. Aim for that stretch goal. Um, and then just see if you can do that. Um, if it seems like it's actually crazy to you, then that should probably be your goal. And the feeling you'll get actually when, when you reach that goal uh, will be phenomenal. And the motivation you'll get to, to make another stretch goal and hit that stretch goal will, will be crazy. Um, you know, sometimes things happen that get in the way between you and that stretch goal, uh, and, and you you maybe hit your baseline goal, and that's okay. Um, but having stretch goals and or just coming up with something that you think you can't do and then doing it is just such a crazy impact on your mindset. I think that that would be one tool or tip that that might just be um, helpful. Fantastic. And last thing. Last thing. You do you have any tips for people who might be feeling a little bit lost? They don't really know if they're on the right track or what that track looks like. Or they don't have motivation. Mm. There, there's two parts in there. There's um not knowing what your track should look like um, or there's also sort of feeling lost even if you've come up with a a rational track like you you sat down you planned a track you've got a rational track and you're sticking to it but you're coming a bit um, sort of disengaged because you're doing the process but you're not seeing the outcomes right Um, that can feel very disheartening like you've done something you're, you're, you're working hard towards something but you're not seeing any reward. Mm. Um, look, you really just have to trust in the process. You really just have to double down. Like you, you know that this process, if it's a credible process um, that you've come up with through through like researching it well, um, or you've gotten someone who has credible a credibility that's told you this is the process you should be doing and it's specific to your circumstances, you really just need to make sure you commit to it um, because the outcomes they will follow, but they don't follow in a linear way, um, and they're not always visible. So you could start. Let's just use grad jobs, right? Because there's so much unseen things. You could start applying for a grad job, um, and and be at let's say level zero, and you send in your application, and HR, are, you know, they're screening it within three seconds. Let's say. That, that happens and you've got a one in 1,000 chance of actually being successful. Then you improve your resume, you, you're really working on yourself uh, and you send in your CV again and it gets screened from HR, then they pass it to the interviewing team um, and you know, you're <laughs> on the shortlist and then they just don't put you in the interview pile. You've gone from, say, a one in a thousand chance for that role to one in maybe 50 or one in a hundred. But you don't see that. All you see is, oh, I've worked on myself. I worked so hard. I've now applied for more interviews, but I'm still getting no response. Um, and then you work on yourself further to that next level. Um, and whatever it is, maybe you've worked on some more skills, taken a course, done uh, an adjacent interview, uh, sorry, internship. And then finally you land your first interview and it's not until the work that you've been doing for what might feel like for ages uh, with no results and then you get your first result, um, it'll just be so much worth, So it'll be so worth it. So you just need to trust the process. Um, It can feel awful when you're getting no positive external feedback, but you really need to get the intrinsic motivation and the process working for you and after committing to that for long enough, you will see the fruit. Um, it's just the fruit from your labor 
do- doesn't doesn't come straight away, unfortunately. Long term thinking, delayed gratification. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's a massive. You've heard about you've heard about the jelly bean experiment. Jelly, was it? Um, was it jelly bean? Marshmallow jelly. I think they did a jelly bean one. Um, I think it was marshmallow. With the kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe it was marshmallow. Oh, I think they did maybe both, but definitely they did the marshmallow one. It's being reproduced tons and tons of times. Yeah. Yeah, it just shows you, doesn't it? It's uh, if you can wait <laughs> that little bit for those two marshmallows or whatever pays off. Okay, fantastic. Well, any final words? No, um, yeah, well, all, all I want to say, like the audience of this, um, I'm assuming, uh, say, students, uh, uni students, or whatever, going through the same process. Um, look, you, the only thing I, I would say, recommend for you guys is really just make sure you come up with a crystal clear, clear like plan of, of what you want to do, um, feeding into that. You need to understand yourself, what you like doing and what's out there and what, what matches. I'd say that a, a mentor or a coach can really help you with that. Um, and secondly, just just do it. Just go out there and do it. Um, it sucks at first, but as you start getting that positive feedback later on, like it, it's an awesome experience and um, it, it's really worthwhile. If anyone has anything that they want to reach out to me and ask about you can always just get me on linkedin i'm sure mackenzie will link that wherever this gets posted anything that really spoke to you that you want to ask me more about feel free to reach out um and i'm sure mackenzie is the same thanks for having me on absolutely of course please feel free to reach out to to either of us and um thank you so much brooke i really appreciate it it's so crazy to think that I could probably get up our first email with each other, but I imagine it's been like, how long? Over two years, yeah. Has it been more than two years? Yeah. No That's way. Hold on, let me just check that. Um, 2021, 20, So close to two years. No way, yeah, wow. Almost two years, so it's been, it's been an awesome journey. Um, great knowing you, and um, <laughs> now I, I, I look forward to seeing where where you go in the future. You know, you you're a really cool guy. I think you have a yeah, fantastic set of skills already, and and your mindset is just like uh, phenomenal. So I cannot wait to see where you go, and um, keep in touch. Obviously, <laughs> no, no, it's awesome. Like what you're doing with grad jobs, like the amount of people you help, the amount of impacts that you're making in people's personal life is is phenomenal. It's more than you know anyone that I really know personally. So so what you're doing is fantastic. So I'm more than happy to. I'm just glad to be a part of this and glad I have the opportunity to give back. Thank you. I appreciate it. Look forward to it. I'll catch you soon. Maybe we'll do another one in a, some a couple of years time or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, like I said, um, I'll be in Adelaide in a little while, so hope we run into each other then. Fantastic, we will. If you're in, if you're in Adelaide, we'll catch up. All right, yeah. thank you, thank you very much, Brooke. Cheers. And thanks everyone for watching. See ya.